Okay, thank you. So this particular chapter, realizing the, the world as the Buddha land, I think becomes a very important chapter. We just began this um, recently, so we're, we're not too far into it. Um, but the section that we're gonna read today, I think is important on several levels. And the several levels that's important is one of the uh, questions that I often get from people is why Tendai Buddhism, not the only Buddhism that feels this way, but Tendai specifically, um, feels that sentiency is endowed not just to people or even to animals such as dogs and cats, you know, or, or pets that we, we all treat as children and think are sentient. Um, right but also to rocks, to grasses, to trees, to streams, to clouds, to mountains, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, what in the knowable world that we see around us is not sentient? And the answer is nothing, everything is sentient. And so people often say to me, well, how can that be? Because we look at sentiency in a particular fashion. If, if we say, well, what is the definition sentiency, it implies that one has to have senses, meaning smell, touch, taste, etc. And that is not the sentiency that is, that is referred to in the Buddhist context. Um, and so <clears throat> keep in mind that when we are looking at this, sentiency as defined, that we're going to be talking about today is a sentiency that is beyond the notion of sentiency that you see when we commonly speak about, you know, things. So when we do uh, the, the four bodhisattva vows, we start with, I vow to save all sentient beings. We're not referring to just mom and dad and, and Joe down the road. We're referring to everything around us. And rocks. I think I think that rocks and trees and streams, et cetera. So we're on page, we, we're starting on page 213. We left off on page 213. Oh, wait, I didn't I'm see that. Sorry. Um, yeah, there's coffee in here if you want to grab some. Oh, yeah. um, or, or tea. Yes. But you have to go to the tea kettles in the kitchen. Um, so but in order to really understand what we were talking about starting on page 213, I think we have to go back to page 212. And I'm going to just read selectively in this, uh, it's a long paragraph. I'm gonna read selectively in this long paragraph to set up where we begin today, because today we're beginning in this way, anti scholars, et cetera. So, the previous paragraph begins, Zanran, and for those who are not aware, Zanran was the, was the fifth patriarch? Fifth patriarch of, of Tiantai in China, uh, and he lived in the seventh century. And he, after Qingyi, who was the founder of, of Tiantai in China, Zanran is considered probably the one who contributed most to mm -hmm. um, the philosophy after after Qi. Mm -hmm. So Zanran also contributed to the thinking about the innate Buddha realm by proposing that even in sentient beings such as rocks and trees possess the Buddha nature. In so doing, he was participating in a broader effort on the part of Chinese Buddhist thinkers to extend the potential for Buddhahood as universally as possible. More specifically, his doctrine may be understood as a development of Qi's teachings, that living beings in their objective environments in all states of existence, from hell dwellers to bodhisattvas and Buddhas, are inherent to the mind at each thought moment. This is coming from 
Chi Yi's teaching on one 3,000 worlds in each moment. That was the basis for that, that statement. Um, every blade of grass, tree, pebble, and particle of dust as perfectly endowed with the Buddha nature as John Ron wrote. Practitioner of the perfect teaching from the beginning to end knows that the ultimate principle is non-dual. And here's a, from a logical perspective, from the notion of sentiency ultimately is coming from non-duality. That's the basis of that, of that perspective. And we, we'll, we'll read about that a little bit more as it goes on. Um, the practitioner of the perfect teaching from beginning to end knows the ultimate principle is non-dual and that there are no objects apart from the mind. Think about that, no objects apart from the mind, which is to say, now we have to think about this, the mind is not referring to your individual thought process in your head. It's not proposing that, it's proposing the mind is something larger. The mind is part of <clears throat> universal cognizance as opposed to individual cognizance. When we think of the mind, we think of, I th we think of the Cartesian, I think therefore I am, would be the ultimate uh, statement of that. From a Zen perspective, one would one might say I am, therefore I think. From a Tiantai perspective, I think, therefore, I am part of the universe. If I could, if I could simplify it to that degree. So, just to to recapitulate that a little bit. The Car Cartesian, I think, therefore, I am. The Zen, I am, therefore, I think. Tiantai, I think, therefore, I am part of the universe. That's my own editorial, by the way. That's not, that's not necessarily in um, Sutra, per se. Yeah, right. Um, who then is sentient? What then is sentient? Within the assembly of the Lotus, speaking of Lotus Sutra, there is no discrimination. Reminds us the Heart Sutra. No sensation. <clears throat> No conception, no discrimination, no awareness, or likewise like this. Although the Buddhahood of insentient beings had been proposed earlier by the San Lun scholars, Ji Zhang from 549 to 623, and others, John Runs is the name most closely associated with the doctrine. And for those who don't know, San Lun would be San Lun is the is the uh, Japanese pronunciation of that school which started in China and San Lun is referring to the three scrolls school. San Lun literally means three, three scrolls school, school. It was never a, it was a doctrinal uh, school insofar as people um, used it as a mechanism of exploring the nature of Buddhism, but it didn't have a separate set of practices and that sort of thing. Um, I'm probably telling you more than you want to know, but here it is. John Runs is the name most closely associated. Against the position of the Hua Hien, which is the Kagon school in Japan, which is the other major doctrinal school in China, which is based upon the Avatamsaka Sutra, and other rival schools, which generally can find the potential for enlightenment to sentient beings. And sentient beings in this case would be um, basically animals, that's, that's, that would be the, the way of looking at as animals. Right. And so therefore, when you look at, at Tibetan Buddhism, they do not hold that sentiency is true in rocks and clouds and mountains, etc. They would hold that only sentiency is restricted to the animal realm. Uh, John Ron asserted, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Mushin. Including worms. In, in right. Sea slugs. <laughs> sea slugs are one of my big ones. I know. Just remember, if you misreport the, the Buddha, you might end up as a sea slug in the next um, life. <clears throat> John Ron asserted that insentient beings also have the nature of suchness and therefore the potential for Buddhahood, thus in effect claiming superior inclusivity or tiantai. 
John Ron played a critical role in the formation of the Tendai sectarian identity, and through him, notions of the potential of Buddhahood of the insentient environment became linked firmly to the Lotus Sutra and the Tiantai school. So having said that, we have to here make a distinction, by the way. And that distinction is this, in, in terms of the sectarian Buddhism. When we looked in China, the Cha'an schools the, the, that were primarily Zen, what we think of as Zen, Zen is the, the Japanese name for Cha'an. Well, actually, Zen is the Japanese name for Son, which is the Korean name for Cha'an, to be precise. The Zen school, the Cha'an schools in China would be like the San Lun schools, which felt that sentiency only existed in animals. Whereas the Tiantai, and, and as well as Hua Hien, as well as San Lun and these others. But because Zen in Japan came out of Tiantai, you find that in Japan, you find Dogen, the founder of Soto Zen yeah. in Japan, who was a Tiantai monk. When he writes the Shobengenzo, he writes about the fact that everything is sentient. So you see this notion of sentiency had evolved from the Chinese notion and in, and, and in Japan, because all of the schools in Japan were derivative of, of Tendai, you have a broader definition of what is sentient within the two Zen, primary Zen schools in Japan, which are Soto and Rinzai. You find the notion of sentient being true in the Pure Land schools, and you find sentiency being present in uh, um, any number of other schools, including Nichiren and, and uh, other, other schools. So in Japanese Buddhism, the Tendai perspective on this takes precedence over the other schools because these other schools were derivative of Tiantai teachings. And, and so we find the real, the real difference in East Asian and Japanese and Korean, because Korean was more influenced by Hua Hien uh, Buddhism uh, in Korea. So now we start where we left off. I just, I wanted to give you sort of a background of where we had been going with this in the past. Um, Louise, would you like to read the next paragraph? It starts in this way. So some people don't have the book, not to worry, we have, many of us have it, and so we'll read the sections as we go along, okay? Please. In this way, Tentai scholars of uh, medieval <clears throat> China elaborated the sophisticated doctrines of the non-duality of the living subject and his or her objective container world, implying that the addition of the land mirrors, the delusion or enlightenment of living beings when the individual practitioner achieves awakening, that person's world becomes the Buddha land. Such thinking remains largely at the level of theoretical speculation. Buddhahood was not seriously envisioned as a goal most practitioners were likely to attain in this lifetime. Nonetheless, in principle, these ideas had the effect of valorizing the present the world, not as a <coughs> escaped but is it inseparable from the realm of ultimate principle okay thank you what what questions or thoughts do people have from this from the paragraph that uh, Weezy read to us anything at all yeah um i guess the question comes to me right toward the end that it's not a place of suffering to be escaped, but is it inseparable from the realm of ultimate principle? Is that where you get the shorthand nirvana is, is samsara and samsara yes. is nirvana? That, that certainly is a very big part of it. And this all goes back to the non-dual principle. That if you, if you have non-duality, how can you say we've got nirvana on one, nirvana on one hand and samsara on the other? And that would be a dualistic, a dualistic notion. And therefore, from a logical premise, 
one had in order to be consistent, not to say that Buddhism is always consistent, but from that logical premise, there is the notion of, well, if they can't, if there's, if there's non-duality, then how can they be different? But I think that this puts a finer point on it. And the finer point is that there were those forms of Buddhism that did look at nirvana as an escape from samsara. You look at the entirety of the Pali Canon, which is what is the goal of becoming an arhat? It's to this, it dissolve this world. Yeah. Well, to dissolve the self, and there, therefore, not therefore avoiding rebirth into samsaric world in the next lifetime. But if there's no self, how can you dissolve it? There is, but there's a provisional self. Well, there's a provisional self. So, so what you're what you're dissolving is the provisional okay. self. Yeah, like the like it's the idea of exhausting the karma that's been generated through right. all the lifetimes leading up to this one, which right. would dissolve the self because it's kind of yeah. <clears throat> any other thoughts or and, and and I think that that Brian picked up on one of the more important aspects of this uh, paragraph, and that is the um, in principle, nonetheless, in principle, these ideas have the effect of valorizing the present. Valorizing the present in, is a way of saying to um, exalt the present, look at the present as greater than we might otherwise view it. Um, the present phenomenal world, not as a place of suffering to be escaped, but as inseparable from the realm of ultimate principle. Ultimate principle being shunyata, uh, emptiness. Uh, that, yeah. that's so, should we go to garbage heaps to meditate? Well, <laughs> we're, we're told <laughs> we're told when you are experiencing arrogance and and too much self esteem, you should go to the charnel ground yeah. to meditate. Right. Mm -hmm. So you you so I would think uh, <laughs> the extension of that would be. If you find your attachment to food to be too great, going to a garbage heap to meditate would be useful. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, wasn't there going to be a meeting at the transfer station for some meditation like tomorrow or something? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, we're all going to meet at the transfer station where we take our crash <laughs> to meditate tomorrow uh, as a way. All those objects you know, that we cast. Right. <laughs> you don't have to go far. You don't have to go far. You can stay home. Oh, yes, you get the bouquet. Okay. <laughs> that ain't just the manure. Right? <laughs> so, uh, Sancho, how would you like to read the next paragraph? Sure. Is, is, uh, are there any other questions or comments before we move along? Mm, let's move. Can you describe oh, it? Wait, wait, hold on just a moment. Please, go ahead. The provisional self. The provisional world is what we're doing right now. That's it. It's the mundane world, the world of everyday existence. It's a world of getting up, putting your clothes on, having breakfast, and doing whatever we do during the day. That's the provision. Kind of like our current reality. Our, our current reality would be another way of looking at it. Right. Uh, the, uh, and, and now I'll go just a, a step beyond that. that. What you're saying is correct. But it's just a go a step beyond and say, we have right now a shared reality, right? That shared reality is in a sense, a kind of delusion because each of us is looking at this shared reality in our unique own way. We each have our own backgrounds, our own teachings, our own way of looking at things. And so while we share this provisional reality on one level, on another level, we're not. On another level, we're experiencing a kind of delusion because my reality is not necessarily the same as tight ends or chips or whatever, because we're here, what we're hearing, we're hearing based upon our preconditioned ideas, our preconditioned notions of what is reality. And going back to that the ultimate principle is that there was a reality beyond this shared reality that reality is shunyata because our provisional reality is filled with conceptualization, discrimination, uh, 
separateness of some separateness. Level, you know yeah and so and so the the ultimate principle that ultimate reality is reality that there there it's an assertion that there is a reality beyond this provisional reality the reality that we're experiencing is real to each of us but doesn't have a reality beyond our individual perception of it not really but objectively there is a reality that's beyond that now to go into that a little bit further one would then look at the talun and other teachings that suggest that this samsaric world which is this provisional reality and the ultimate or absolute which is shunyata are really one and the same it's only our perception of it that makes it different in other words the objective reality is still here it's still operational it's still present but we're just not perceiving it mm -hmm. and then to go one step further one would say that awakening is when our perception of that ultimate reality is closer to the provisional or the provisional is closer to the ultimate Maybe it'd be a better way to state it. Yeah. Uh, Chip, did you, you had your hand up? Yes. Uh, like when you read this stuff, and it, it kind of makes sense to you, and you think, uh, yeah, this is this is reality, but you know. Uh, speaking as American, whose father fought uh, World War II in the China against the Japanese, um, there is there's some feeling that you can be wrong, even though you have this great idea of non-duality and how how things are like this, you can still make wholly wrong decisions. And, uh, the well, whole country, what? Japan. <laughs> Fighting against yeah. great America, you know. Uh, I, you know so, but but are you conflating the fact that all Japanese at that time were following Buddhist principles? Uh, that's what you're implying. I just right. It's not true. No, because you've got to remember. As a matter of fact, there are scholars who would maintain one of the reasons that Japan became imperialist is because the Meiji Restoration persecuted Buddhism, and they were no longer following Buddhist values, which led to the imperialism, which led to the war, uh, the war in Asia. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, and that's not to, that's not to say, by the way, that you had supranationalists, Soto Zen was supranationalist. Some of the people who brought Zen to this country were anti-Semitic, racist, etc. Right. Oh, it was seven teachers, and you had uh, other groups that fought vociferously for the emperor in World War II because they have nationalists because they've been persecuted before and wanted to regain their power. So, because one has the ideal, doesn't necessarily one realizes it. The ideal of America is we are all created equal, and yet we still have racism, we still have segregation. We still have white privilege. But our ideal is that we that all people are created equal. Well, the ideal and the reality often don't mix. Yes, I mean, some are more equal than uh, others. Each other, I should say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mushi. Some are more equal than others in America. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So so don't so just because Japan has a history of Buddhist teachings, and this particular form of Buddhism is from Japan, doesn't necessarily mean that human beings are going to follow whatever ideals that we hold. It's up to us as individuals to maintain those ideals. The society as a whole is going to do something else. Well. So even though you hear this stuff, you have to uh, understand it or you have to you have to you have to put it into context you have to make it real for you right and i think that here's a point at which and now i'm going to preach 
Okay? This is preaching. This is not explication. That's the point at which understanding that the mind is universal, that the mind is not just within here. How do we change the violence that we see in the United States? We don't, we, we, we certainly can change it to an extent by legislation. You know, there's things we can do to legislate to reduce it, mitigate it, whatever. But ultimately, we have to change the mind. And by that, I don't mean the small mind that exists in here. I mean the large mind. The changing the large mind begins with changing the small mind. Having the small mind, having you, Chip, recognize that your thoughts, your actions are part of the larger whole. And over time, hopefully, that larger whole will be enhanced by what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're acting. That that's the basis of the Buddha world. That really is the basis of it. Mushin, you had your hand up. Yes, I was curious. Uh, enlightened masters walk <laughs> around experiencing the world as part of themselves and not experiencing, not having that distinction of separateness? Well, it depends upon what you're, how you're defining enlightened master. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that just to be, you know, uh, cute or dismissive. How one looks at, you know, when you use the term enlightened master, I think that there are those individuals who attain awakening. Right. And are they enlightened masters? At what point is enlightenment part of awakening? There are really two, two things we're talking about at this level. But I, I'll tell you, speak, you know, uh, uh, Job is going to be speaking on, on Hagame in two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's talking about that. I think Hagame was an, exam an example of an awakened person. And his actions and his thought was probably much closer to that ideal that we're talking about than yours or mine by comparison. Right. And so when I had spoken to uh, Ajari in the past, you know, and I've said this, I can tell an Ajari by looking at them. If the person were walking down the street and I looked at that person, I could recognize an Ajari that was there if the person didn't say anything. There is something about the face of that person that is different than the face of the other person who's walking down the street. And I think it has something to do with it, not only their bearing, but also a kind of mental emanation that they give off. I don't know how to describe it. There's the kind of mental emanation that they give off. Aura. 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 Uh, you know, I, people say, yeah. It, it could be, I don't know. But for, in, for instance, when I have had a conversation with certain Ajari, one of the things that is consistent with them is the degree to which they see themselves as just part of the larger whole. Yeah. As to look how great I am. You know, that's that's one of the characteristics. Oh, yeah. The Shoshin had her. Oh, Shoshin, please go ahead. So I. I think you you touched on this briefly, but I'm interested in the line at the um, be, uh, relatively the beginning of that paragraph where it says that um, uh, implies that the condition of the land mirrors the delusion or enlightenment of living beings. And I in the word land made me wonder we must be the most delusional um kalpa of uh of all because of the condition of the planet i know that's taking it maybe too no. literally but it, no, that's right. I, I i just wanted you to comment on it because i i might be taking it too literally or maybe not i, I don't think you're taking it too literally at all I and remember, Jackie Stone wrote this article, um, and uh, I now I think Jackie is actually Professor Emeritus. I don't think he's any longer uh, active faculty member at Princeton. Um, <clears throat> but 
the answer to and, and and she wrote she has written extensively on pretty much what you're talking about right now um and so you're right on the other hand human beings are not the only ones who are like that if you take a great ape the gorillas whom we all cherish as gentle creatures people are not aware that that gorillas destroy their environment mm -hmm. and one of the reasons that they lose their their space is because they destroy their environment and they have to move on because they've got no place to stay when we look when we look at a group of you know there's the carrying capacity of the land which is to say that certain animals when they reach a certain population will actually outstrip the ability of the land to provide for them so it's not just human beings we're bringing this back into the sentiency notion of what is sentient and what is insentient carrying capacity of the land means not only humans but it's referring to wolves it's referring to rabbits it's referring to mice whatever animal we can think of and even plants plants will overtake an area and drive out everything else i mean we we, we try to think that nature is a balance no, it's and it's not really so much a balance as it is a negative feedback loop it's a continual negative feedback loop and it's reaches homeostasis only through going through extremes ups and downs like this over time so going to back to, to shoshin's term when she when jackie is referring to um implying the conditions of land mirrors the delusion of the enlightenment of living beings etc that's take that very literally take that very literally and and i think that the extent to which we have defiled our nest is reminiscent of the way gorillas defile their nests or mice defile their nests if they take over et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're all subject to delusion. Um, just remember, you know, one of my favorite phrases is that there is no, uh, that human beings have an infinite capacity for delusion. <laughs> <laughs> But we could change that to sentient beings have an infinite capacity for delusion. Okay. <clears throat> Who's your? Was there any other questions before we go on? And by the way, I, I think we're having a great discussion this morning. I appreciate everyone's attention. Okay. Japanese commentators also read the Lotus Sutra in terms of a non dual reality in which this world is inseparable from the Buddha land. But they carry this line of interpretation in new directions. As noted in the first chapter of this volume, Tendai Buddhism in Japan quickly came to be differentiated from its parent, continental Tiantai, by its incorporation of esoteric Buddhism. The cosmic Buddha of the esoteric teachings, Mahaverochana in Sanskrit, or Dainichi in Japanese, is understood not as a person, whether historical or mythic but as the Dharma realm or universe itself. All forms are his body, all sounds are his speech, all thoughts are his mind. Or alternately, alternatively, the same six elements of earth, water, fire, wind, space, and mind <clears throat> make up the body and mind of both the cosmic Buddha and the practitioner. Thus, there is originally no distinction them. This inherent identity of the practitioner's body, speech, and mind with those of the cosmic Buddha could, it was said, be manifested in the performance of the three mysteries, the mudras or scripted symbolic gestures, chanting of mantras, incantations, and visualization exercises, thus realizing Buddhahood with this very body. In the Tendai esoteric teachings, Taimitsu, the cosmic Buddha is identified with the primordial enlightened Shakyamuni, the lifespan chapter. His realm, that is the entire universe, is conceived, conceived in Mandelic terms as ever-present, ongoing, 
Lotus, Lotus Sutra Assembly. Thank you. Okay. What, what strikes you in this that you'd like to ask questions about or comment on anything particularly? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm kind of curious about this distinction between Tendai and Tiantai. So is it only that the sutras and the actual esoteric practices aren't really emphasized in Tiantai, or is it that there's literally like no concept of Mahavarachana in Tiantai? Okay. <clears throat> when Tiantai, there, there's a, a chronological uh, issue that's here. When we look at the esoteric teachings, they had begun at Nalanda, probably sometime in, well, we don't, we don't know exactly. We have records of them having been in Nalanda by the second or third century. But they may have very well occurred earlier than that. We just don't have a record of earlier than that. They were not brought to China. They, they were, well, I shouldn't say that. They, they came to China sort of piecemeal. So there were esoteric teachings being introduced into China between whenever they started at Nalanda in India until the foundation of Tiantai in the sixth century. However, it wasn't until 725, 100 and plus years after the foundation, the founding of 200 some odd years after the founding of Tiantai in China, that you have the Mahavirachana Sutra being introduced and reified as an esoteric teaching in China. Okay, so there's a, a period of about 200 years difference between that. Now, were there esoteric? There were definitely mudras and mantras. You have the Dainichi. I'm sorry. You have the. Uh, what am I trying to say? The Dharani that you have in the Lotus Sutra and in other sutras. You have Dharani, which are mantric in nature that had been introduced and they were being used. You had mudras, the very simple got the very simple meditation mudra of placing your left hand on your right hand, your thumbs touching is a mudra, as an example. Gasho, putting your hands together, is bringing together the earth, the water, fire, wind, and space, the ether, together in recognition, that's that's another mudra. So you have mudras and mantras, you certainly had visualizations. Uh, Amitabha, Amita visualizations, and circumambulation with mudras and mantras, namo mirabhu, namo mirabhu, they were present in pure land, starting in the second century. You've got some, starting in the second century in China. However, when we view what came to Japan that at the very beginning of, well, when it was brought from, from Saicho in Kukai at the very beginning of the ninth century, that was a formulation of the esoteric practices in a particular form, which had not been present in Tiantai. So Tiantai Buddhism could not have brought something as a package that didn't exist <laughs> under, under Saicho and and Chan Ran, as an example. Um, is, does that help? Okay, Mushin. So when we meditate, should we be uh, invoking a Dainichi Nyurai, uh, Dainichi Nyurai and uh, seeing ourselves as having the same uh, uh, body, speech, and mind? If as that's the a uh, mythic Buddha? If that's the meditation you're doing, not at all times. Okay. I mean, I do, you do the Goshimbo, right? Right. The Goshimbo is exactly what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing the Goshimbo <laughs> properly, you're doing the visualization, the meditation on that. We could do a meditation on uh, visualizing Amida Buddha. We could be doing a meditation on visualizing Dainichi Nyorai. Those are all legitimate meditations, but it doesn't mean every time you meditate, you do that. Right, okay, I got it, yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions or thoughts? 
Yes, Does visualization have anything to do with what you might conceive of it? Like, okay, the visuals, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. The very beginning of, of the Goshimbo, the Goshimbo are five combinations of mudras, mantras, and visualizations that I do on uh, the, the leader of the service does on the Raihan and the platform at the beginning of a service, right? And so the very first one is this, okay? And you look at it and you say, okay, you're, that looks like gasho. Well, it's not really a gasho, it's a purification. You're bringing those five elements together and the mudra that goes along with that in translation, it, in, in Sanskrit, it's almost maha, sudha sabradana, maha sudha hum. That's the Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. but the English translation of that is Om, all things are pure by nature, therefore I too am pure by nature. And you're visualizing washing away all the hindrances and impediments that exist. It's a pure, that's the purification. And then you're offering it up to others. Okay. So the leader is doing that for everybody in the room, not just for his or herself. They're doing it for everyone who's there. So therefore, everybody else doesn't have to do it. Now, when you, when the individual, and, and by the way, by speech of mind, you'll hear it referred to as senmitsu, san meaning three and mitsu meaning mikyo or the, like the three mysteries. That's body, speech, and mind. Um, the action of doing those together is to replicate the consciousness of the universe mm -hmm. to say that all things are pure by nature is an assertion of what is the nature of the universe. There are no impurities. We introduce the impurities. You can, you, to put it into a, a, a Judeo-Christian context, one of the bases of Christianity is that there was original sin, right? That's a statement of there is no original sin. <laughs> I mean, I'm just using that as a contrast. I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. I'm just using it as a contrast. So there is no original sin. Oh, all things are pure by nature. That's the Buddha land. That's exactly what's being stated by the Buddha land. All things are without conceptualization, discrimination, awareness. Now, so the visualization that occurs in that, and this is when I was addressing Chip before, I put that out into the consciousness of the world. It seems like, well, it doesn't seem to be working because we just had eight, seven people killed and 30 plus people seriously injured. On the other hand, it could very well be that if I were putting that out, a hundred people would have been killed. And tens of dozens. In other words, we can't prove one way or the other that something exists because it's beyond experimentation, it's beyond proof, it's beyond um, how we might view that. So the visualization is a way of bringing those thoughts out into the cosmos in a very real way. And the idea of the mudras is a way of sealing it within the heart. That's the body. The speech is the mantra, which is Om Svaha Sudha Sarva Svaha Sudham, which is the Sanskrit. And then the visualization is a way of the mind, body, speech, and mind. But the mind is not just my mind, it's the mind of everyone who's present, and it's the mind of the cosmos. Is that? Yeah. So just on the, yeah, so just <clears throat> say when we're um, in the, uh, in the hondo, hondo, the the sendo, <laughs> um, and we're reading the uh, parts of the meditation, yeah. and you get to the part about, you know, karma and many, you know, regret. Right, and, the, the and, very beginning. Yes. yes. Now, would that be a visit, visualization? You can, yes, yeah, okay. yeah, you can do that. Because you sort of like, oh my God, right. just even in this like It says, in the past, I've committed exactly. negative karma. This right. was caused by and my I, body speaking. When mind. I read that, it's like. <clears throat> right, 
and, 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 and to be quite candid, if I'm doing morning service or the daily service in the morning, I'm actually thinking about what did I do yesterday? Boy, did I screw up. <laughs> I can't believe I said that to so-and-so or I, right. why did I, why did I do that instead of something else? That's, I'm physically thinking about that because I'm trying to then change my behavior for today. That's why it's at the beginning. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah, because I go back through my whole life. <laughs> right. Like, oh, oh. You? But then it's like, it is what it is. I, you know, uh, it happened. I can't figure it out. I, I sometimes think back and I think I had a professor called Bill Stein. And Bill was a, a I won't go into the whole thing, but I, I think back, I had Bill's class probably in 1970. Six or seven. Mm -hmm. No, it was probably 1978 or 79. Now, seven. and um, and I. So that was how many years ago? Forty plus years ago. And I think, and I'll think to myself, I said that in the middle of class to Bill Stein. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. And by the way, I was really stoked that day. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, so the Goshimbo uh, is uh, the mudras, mantras, and visualizations right. uh, are, uh, are only for uh, ordained um, practitioners. <clears throat> no, that's what I was saying before. There's two levels of it. The, when, when, if you're doing the Goshimbo, Right, all the people that are present in the room at the time are receiving benefit from that. You're not doing it for yourself. If you are, then you're you're mistaken. You should be doing it for everyone in the room. Number one. Number two, there are other mudras and mantras that we all perform all the time. And and so when when you're putting your hands together in Gasho, and you're reciting. Pogo, or you're putting your hands together in Gasho and you're reciting the Heart Sutra, and you get down to Gate Gate Paragate Parsangate Bodhisvaha, that is what everybody, not just the ordained person, is doing. Now, the ordained person has taken the time, they, they have been given the time, take the time, however we might look at it, to learn to do all those additional mudras and mantras and Visualizations. But that's because, and, and one has to be ordained to do that because one is then committed not to oneself, but to everyone else. That's part of the bodhisattva vow. You're not doing now, and, and, and probably this is going on more than people are interested, but just to, to make clear about this, when one begins learning to do those, one does it for oneself. But then if you don't transform that, from oneself to doing it for others, then you're doing it incorrectly. Mm -hmm. That's not the intention. The intention ultimately is you do it for oneself initially because that's perceived to be the way people are. That's just a recognition of human nature. I got mine, you know, <laughs> sort of attitude, mm -hmm. but the individual should be transformed by those things. Now one is doing it for the others, not for oneself, to, to give up oneself for the other. And that's why, you know, you're, you're very much against the notion in various sutra about the, the people who self-emulate. Well, that's also a metaphor to rid oneself of one's own body for the benefit of others. That's the metaphor that's inherent in that. You know, okay. Any other questions or thoughts before? We... Yes, Joshi. Um. Then the Goshimbo. Um, we were taught that Goshimbo in in Gyo as you know, and it became part of what we had to do for ordination. But so theoretically, then, uh, and we were taught that you know these mudra and mantra are, are so important that 
there's not a pamphlet you could read or anything to teach you how to do it because these things are handed down from master to disciple and things are even left out of instruction. So it'll be done uh, properly be, uh, from the disciple, uh, uh, from the master to the disciple so that nobody can learn it without proper instruction. But um, can, so should anybody, for instance, um, who's, who's, taken refuge uh learn the goshimbo mudra and mantras and visualizations or is it just i don't know people who are going to be ordained and then they do it for everybody in other words could you have a class and teach everyone goshimbo that's what i'm wondering yeah, good question yeah the answer is no <laughs> right. that's because the direct because because well two things one of which is well several things the first reason is because the person will have had to take tokido an ordination which is to say that they are not when one takes refuge one is taking refuge in the buddha the dharma and the sangha when one takes ordination oh. one is taking a vow to devote oneself to the teachings and to the benefit of others that is greater than one has for oneself. And a person who has had refuge is not necessarily taking that vow. That's number one. Number two, the reason it's given, the reason that, that, that it's given individually and it's given in a particular way is because there's the notion of mind to mind transmission. <laughs> and the person who's giving it has to have had Tanjo. And that is Abhisheka, which is talked about in a later in a later place. And so the person has to have had Tanjo. And the person, and the reason the person has to have Tanjo is because they have been tested to the level, to that level, and demonstrated that they have both the character and the knowledge to transmit it. And the third thing is that it's not necessary for everyone to do it because if you're raising a family, as an example, do you have the time to devote yourself to those things? You rightfully are devoting yourself to your family. You know, that's just the nature of, of everyday life. Um, you know, I, I find it really interesting that it's really hard for, for instance, Koshin, because he's got a family to fulfill many of his duties. Now, it would be easier, and I, I don't mean this in a negative way, it would be easier if he had married an Otera Oksan, a temple wife, who has an understanding of what that means and gives him the opportunity to do some of those things. But that's not the way it is in our society. I mean, Tamani devotes herself. You can't believe, right now, people don't realize that Tamami spent all of last weekend working on the paperwork, he's spending all this weekend doing translations so that Shingaku can go to Yezan and doing translations for Tenda. How many people that are on line right now or in this room are gonna spend that time doing that? And why is she doing it? Because she took the vows to do that. That's the distinction, okay? Any other thought? Yeah, go ahead, Mushi. So uh, I meditate alone uh, a number of times during the week. Right. And I, I do go shimbo before I do the meditation. Yeah. And, but I am I live alone. <laughs> and uh, should I be thinking about everybody else when I'm doing it? Or you be thinking about yourself. Pardon? You should not be thinking about yourself when you do okay. it. All right. That's the key. Yeah. Uh, Brian, go ahead, please. Yeah. When you were talking about this, I was thinking when I when I first started um, um, at going to Pure Land Services, you know, at the end of the chanting, there's always, no matter what chant you do, there's the merit transfer. Right. And 
at first, well, that's cute. Yeah, I liked it, but it was just, it's the words that you said. Now, after years of doing it, I, I really almost feel like, yeah, I used to chant because I liked the chanting. Now I like the chanting because there's all these different voices that we, we're not a choir, okay? But somehow they all work together somehow. And then the merit transfer becomes great because like I, we've done all this chanting and now we're just giving it away. And I even try to remember certain people I know who've had like struggles through that week and say, well, make sure this merit goes to them. But like what you said always struck me about my Very whole good. life in Bo Buddhism is that I first had to learn to do it for myself before I could do it for anybody else. There was no way to get to what I understand now about the, you, I, you couldn't teach me it. There's no, 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 no way that you could say that's what merit transfer is, unless I took the baby step of first doing all that chanting just because I, I thought it was cool to chant. Right. <laughs> well, and and, and, and I, I think you're making the point very well that very nice. there, there is a recognition of human nature in a lot of these teachings. It's just a recognition that if I start to say to everybody, hey, go out and do it for everybody else, it's like, screw this. You know, <laughs> I, got, I got things that are important. I got places to be i got you know etc um but that becomes a real a really big deal um and and i i think that that self-absorption uh is one of the you know we don't there's no of the five hindrances self-absorption is not one of them but i would say that self-absorption is greater than all of them <laughs> greater than all of these is self-absorption self you know yeah Okay, so we got down to, hey, we're almost finishing a page. Um, this might be a record for us. This, this could be a record. Yeah. You Martin, you can see that we, we, don't, we, we don't move right along. Do we? No, you're pretty, you're pretty advanced. Okay. Well, this conversation has been very helpful to me. Good, thank you. Um, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Jonin, uh, page 213, the last paragraph, under the influence. Yes, we are. <laughs> Tamami, what did you put in the coffee? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Influence of Tendai esotericism during Japan's medieval period, roughly 12th through 16th centuries. The Lotus Sutra itself came to be read from the perspective of original enlightenment, Ogaku, which was understood as the deep message of the original teaching on Mon, or latter 14 chapters of the Sutra. According to original enlightenment doctrine, Buddhahood is not a potential to be realized as the final result of practice. But the true state of all things just as they are, although ordinary deluded people do not realize this. Thus, practice is redefined not as a means to an end, but as the vehicle for accessing an enlightenment that in some sense is already present. Could we stop? Could we stop there? This is a long paragraph, so I want to stop there because I want to point out a couple of things that have, and, and you'll continue tonight. That have already been stated. And the first thing is that note that it says under the influence of Tendai's esotericism during mid Jap Japan's medieval period, the first sentence, roughly 12th through 16th century. That was the period of time that you had all the other schools of Buddhism that were the founders of which were coming out of Tendai. That's the period of time in which Honen and Shenron. In the Pure Land schools were as Tendai monks saying, we're going to start a school of our own based solely upon the Pure Land. That was the time in which Rinzai Zen and Soto Zen founders, um, Isai and Dogen, were coming out of Tendai and say, we're going to concentrate only on meditation. Then you had Nichiren coming out at that time saying, we're going to concentrate 
only on the uh, exaltation of the Lotus Sutra, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. That was the time in which you had a dozen other sects that are not as well known, but are nonetheless important um, to Japanese Buddhism coming out. I don't think that it was there. Often that's presented, that period of time is presented as a time by many other schools in which Tendai Buddhism was being corrupted and they left that corruption. That become, became a much later justification for their leading, leaving. But I see it as a time in which, because of the notion of Hongaku being present and simultaneously, the notion of Mapo in Japan being uh, reified that now is the time of the beginning of Mapo, which is the period of degenerate dharma. So it wasn't saying that Tendai monks were necessarily corrupted. It was saying based upon the three periods of the dharma, all monks were corrupted, that they came out and they started that. In other words, Mapo, Ongaku, and a few other elements of, that I won't go into now, were all coming together at the same time to bring about those changes in the structure of Buddhism in Japan, not the least of which were purely political. I mean, uh, especially Dogen found that if he was going to receive um, patronage from the shogunates, then he had to leave Tendaishu because that was associated with the imperial family. You know, that, that, those were all, those were all issues also. <laughs> is there anything else? The, the dog is running, the dog is running around because the bicyclist went by. And the dog knows that bicycles are a form of two-wheeled demon. <laughs> um, Jake has a hand up. Jake, you have your hand up. Yeah, so just uh, two quick questions. So the first one is, uh, so if I understood what you were trying to say, are, are you suggesting that because the doctrine of original enlightenment was coming about during this time that uh, people like Nietzscheren and, and those who created the new Buddhist schools uh, felt like that idea was problematic and was almost being... Uh, no, no, it wasn't it was problematic. It was exactly the opposite. And, and oh. what I mean, was the, the, the notion of Hongaku actually goes back all the way to, to Chanran and Chigi and the Fatu Lun uh, that, that Chigi uh, recites quite often in the Mahashikan. But so the idea was there. And so if you were Honen, as an example, the notion is, hey, enlightenment is already here. What's to be achieved? So. It was always in it was always in Tendai, but during that period of time, the medieval period, it was being exemplified much more. Now, specifically in the Pure Land teachings, you had Genshin, who had written the Ojo Joshu, that really discusses that in detail about how Hongaku is related to the Pure Land of Amida Buddha. So that it, it wasn't that they were rejecting that notion, they were adopting that notion. And you had the notion within the Zen schools in which while the Pure Land schools were, were saying, look, we're in the period of Mapo. And remember within Tendai, there was the recognition of Mapo, but there was also the recognition that that doesn't mean that we can't do something about it. So there was an acceptance on one level, uh, there wasn't a denial of it, but there was a sense that we can do something about this. So the Zen schools looked at this and they said, wait a second, oh, you got Hongaku, enlightenment is there. And they're taking the, the Tendai notion of, we don't have to attain something, but through Jidiki for our own self effort, we have to, un we have to reveal it. Distinction. In Chaan, earlier on in China, <coughs> Lin Chi, which became Rinzai in Japan, you had the notion that it was because it had been affected so much by, <coughs> excuse me, 
by Taoist influences, you had this notion of attainment of enlightenment, that enlightenment is something that you attain. In Japan, you had, Tiantai, you had Tendai giving rise to the notion that the enlightenment is already there. You have to uncover it. It's really, it may sound like it's just semantics, but it's not. It's a very real difference in how you view the nature of the world. And when you look at Lotus Sutra chapter eight, to me, which is, you know, as Joe says uh, often, what will ask a teacher, what is your favorite sutra and what is your favorite chapter within the sutra? My favorite chapter is actually chapter eight, the chapter in which the person has the gem within the, the hem of their garment mm -hmm. and, and they, they go through life in a terrible way and discover later that it's been there all along. To me, that is the lesson that is, is um, <clears throat> that we don't understand in American, in, in Buddhism in America, that that is something that we seem to have not conveyed very well over time. And people tend to think that I have to attain something as opposed to I have to uh, take what is already there and be, and be transformed by it, as opposed to, I have to attain something. I, I think it, and, and this is my editorial judgment, I think it has to do with the Protestant, um, what do you call that? Um, Re Reformation? Work of no, no, the, the Protestant ethic that developed in America from the time of the pilgrims, uh, you know, that was part of Calvinism and all that, that's part of our consciousness. And, and it's, it's, I, I, I mean, I, I'm serious. Sensei, that, that, isn't that's it also, not, it's part of the thing that you have to work for your salvation. You know, how do you get salvation? Is it faith or is it works? Right, mm -hmm. right. And, and to, to what degree, especially among American Buddhists, are they willing to, to release themselves and to recognize that there are forces in the universe that are working for their benefit, we we don't we don't want to look at that. That requires what we think of as belief, as opposed to what, from a Buddhist perspective, is referred to as faith. And there's a distinction between faith and belief in that respect. Belief often does not requires a kind of, of blind acceptance. Faith requires a confidence in what that the teachings are correct. And I think that's one of the that's one of the big differences. Okay. Yes, Mushing. Yeah. So nowadays, uh, how does Tendaishu um, regard the single practice schools that have um, broken off from from uh, from Tendai? From Tendai. Well, it, it you know it's it's interesting because. Tendai views that with pride, and it has a very Tiantai understanding of the teaching, and that is that there's not one method that's right for everybody. Mm -hmm. For some people, meditation is the right practice. For other people, Nambutsu is the right practice through Pure Land. For other people, Nichiren is the right practice. So really, because Tendai contains all of those things, and, and Tendai is equal parts practice and scholarship. And so there's the notion that, and I'll put it this way, I don't think it's inconsequential that Tendai is the interfaith and ecumenical school in Japan. Mm -hmm. It wasn't started by Nichida and it wasn't started by Rich Koskai, it was started by right. Tendai. Right. And the notion I had, Nichiren practitioners coming to Tamonin saying, hey, you know, this is this is present in, in Nichiren, and we do it, you know, we do this practice in Nichiren, but it comes out of Tendai, but we're not sure if I'm doing it properly. Could you instruct me how do I do this properly? I'd say, sure. You know, so when I was living at Tamonin, I would have Nichiren practitioners, Jodo practitioners, Shenshu practitioners who were coming as uh, priests, when I'm not talking about just, just lay folks, 
but priests who are coming to say we need more information about whatever this is. So Tendai is the source from which those things arose. And from a Tendai perspective, you know, I took a vow not just to make more Buddhists, but to help people on their spiritual path. And if your person's spiritual path is meditation, I'll help with the meditation. If it's chanting Nambutsu, I'll help them with Nambutsu. If it's Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, I'll help with that. that. That's the way Tendai looks at it. I got it. About line dancing. Thank you. <laughs> line dancing is not part of it. <laughs> Private joke. <laughs> Okay, and we finished. Uh, I don't know if we're going to finish this paragraph. <laughs> Tendai rules. <laughs> where, where did you, where did you? Uh, uh, um, us, us practice is redefined. Okay, not as a means to an end, but as the vehicle for accessing an enlightenment that is, in some sense, already present. And of course, from this perspective, this world is already the Buddha land. Concepts sometimes expressed metaphorically in the phrase, the assembly on sacred vulture peak is solemnly present and has not yet dispersed. Okay, I'm going to stop there because we're almost out of time, and to continue on would require a lot of next, the next <laughs> half of the paragraph or whatever that is, requires a lot of, of uh, discussion. Um, <clears throat> so, but, uh, but I think that what it's that what um, Jodan just read that that sentence or two sentences, whatever it is. Um, and of course, from this perspective, this world is already the Buddha land concepts sometimes expressed metaphorically, etc. We don't think you know, it, it, let me just give a, a really brief background and. <clears throat> from a common sense, everyday perspective. This house that we're in right now, president, will be 200 years old next year. And it was originally built in 1790 and burned in the early 1820s and was rebuilt on the same foundation 200 years ago. One can say that's interesting, and it is. It's also interesting that it was originally a Shaker house. Mm, yeah. we're, we're 10 miles from New Lebanon Shaker Village and about 15 or so miles from the Hancock Shaker Village. Shakers believed that this world is heaven. And that's why their industry and their works were representative, indicative of trying to create heaven in this world. And I find that it's karma that a Tendai Buddhist institution ends up on a property whose religion was based on the notion that this is the Buddha land, mm -hmm. what you're existing in right now. And so the question is, how do we then transform what we view as the mundane into a Buddha land? How do we transform the nature of our consciousness, the consciousness that we as individuals, the consciousness that we as being located in North America, being located in the world, being located in this universe, how do we recognize the Buddha land exists here, shakers had the same difficulty. How do they convey that? And so they did it through the furniture they manufactured. They did it through the type of industry that they all held. They all had a purpose. They all worked for the common good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and keeping in mind that early on, they were a refuge for, for freed slaves, slaves who had escaped. They were among the people who joined the Shaker communities in this area, you know. Um, I, I, I find that that's really not a coincidence. I find that when we talk about consciousness on the larger level, that there was something that, that that 
very practical perspective is present. It wasn't a coincidence that we got here. And I could go through how we should not have been able to buy this property. But it's interesting that there was a, because just to very, very briefly, so mommy and I did not have jobs. We had a little bit of money saved. We had been living abroad for seven years, so we had no credit. We had been, um, we had, our, our, you know, our, we had good credit in Japan, but they don't look at that in the States. They don't care where you have good credit elsewhere. And, and yet a bank gave us the money, the mortgage to start this place. Think of the odds of that. How, has anybody ever gone for a mortgage? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and how many and how many of you would have gotten mortgage and said, oh, okay, where's your income? Well, I don't have one. <laughs> oh, well, are you, you know, then where's all your money? I don't have any. <laughs> and yet we got, you know, <laughs> we, we got a mortgage. <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> So when I say that it's not a coincidence, I think that it, it and I'm not saying that there's fate involved. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that there's karma, that that's an example of, of karma. And the, what the bank said specifically was the banker, it was a business, uh, a business mortgage. And the banker said is that, look, you don't meet any of the criteria, but we need people like you in the community. That was the basis for it. Was based totally on character, yeah. you know, mm. and so I, I think that 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 becomes an important lesson in in its own way. Uh, uh, Brian, you had your hand up. Yeah, the banker was yeah. a bodhisattva. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, when you say what you do, just real quick, like I I, I have Zoom meetings with my sangha here in New York City. And, I'm, I, and I drive them a little crazy, I think, because I'm always saying, I say, remember, we're on Vulture Peak right now, or we're in Jetta Grove. And, and, and <laughs> I say that, and then I say, because I want you to think, if you were really on Vulture Peak, or you were really on Jetta Grove, how would you act? Right. You're, you, you're sitting there with the Buddha and all the Maitreya and all these great people. How would you act? So remember, even in this little, even our little group right here is also in Jetta Grove in the rainy season. And That's let's, right. and let's, and I, and so I try to say, it's like when you, and whenever you're greeting somebody, they may be Maitreya. You don't know that they're not the next enlightened Buddha. So act accordingly. And, mm -hmm. and that's what transforms everything because it's like, since you can't know that they're not the Buddha, you better treat them well. You know, because if they are, they're going to remember you. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just make the statement, and then we'll have to close it out. When we put our very good Joshua, which is a mudra, and we bow, what we are supposed to be recognizing is, I venerate the Buddha that resides within you. That's what we are doing. It becomes really difficult when there's somebody that you're doing that to with whom you have real conflict, <laughs> but you still are supposed to do that. You put your hands together, you bow, and you say to yourself, I recognize the Buddha that resides within you. So thank you, everyone. I think we had a good session this morning. And um, everyone have a good week. I'll see many of you on.